Jesus paid a price for us that we could not pay. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay a price for you. This is going to cost me something. It's going to cost me some pain. It's going to cost me some time. It's going to cost me something. But I'm willing to pay it to demonstrate my love for you. That's what it is. Karen and I have been married for 42 years. We have a great marriage. This is constant. This is something that even if you have a good marriage, you constantly have to make a choice to redeem your spouse through Christ-like love when they do something wrong, because we all do stuff wrong, and when they hurt you, because we all hurt each other to some extent, even in good marriages. So there's, let me give you several truths about redemptive love. The first is Jesus redeemed us through His righteous suffering. It is the only reason that we're saved from sin and the main reason that we love Jesus. This text ends by saying, now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Let me ask you a question. Why did we return to Jesus? We were in our sins. We were, we were doing the, the wrong thing. Why did we return to Jesus? Well, let me give you the wrong answer. The wrong answer is because we have to and because he's going to clobber us if we don't. That's the wrong answer. The right reason is because no one has ever loved me like Jesus Christ. Right? No one has ever loved me in my sins like Jesus did. And I didn't return to Jesus from a threat or from a demand. I returned to Jesus because His love is inductive. There's no one that can love me like Jesus, and I love Him. Okay, So this is what it's saying here. The, the reason that we're saved and the reason that we love Jesus the way that we do, He's the most loved person in the history of the world. No one's ever been loved the way Jesus Christ is loved. And the reason is there has been, never been a person who demonstrated redemptive love to people who were undeserving. If we got what we deserved, we would be a pile of ashes on the chair right now. But we got what we didn't deserve because Jesus died for our sins. Okay, That's number one. And by the way, in 1 Peter chapter 2, what we just read here, is telling us that Jesus left us an example to redeem each other. In 1 Peter 3.1, it says, In the same way you wives... In 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, husbands likewise. So it tells us that we're going to have to redeem each other. Then all of chapter 3 of 1 Peter is talking about how wives redeem their husbands when they're doing something wrong and when they're, how husbands redeem their wives when they're doing something wrong. In other words, it's the example of redemptive love. The second truth about redemptive love is there are no good spouses you can pick up for free. They all have to be redeemed. And I, I've, done, I've done a lot of weddings. I've counseled a lot of people. And it helps when you prepare beforehand. Pre-marriage counseling helps. It helps to date correctly. But even if you do everything right, you're going to have problems in your marriage you're going to have to use redemptive love for. And when I say problems that you're going to have to use redemptive love for, some are like a 10. Out, out, out of one out of 10, I've seen redemptive situations. I'll tell you about one in just a minute that was a 10 on a scale from 1 to 10. A lot of the times that we redeem each other through redemptive love, it may not be a 10, but it's a 4 or a 5. And if you start accumulating those things, you hurt each other, you reject each other, you don't know you're doing it, you don't mean to do it, you're, you're distracted, you're, you know, you're, you're not meeting each other's needs, something's going on and it bothers you. And when you're in a marriage relationship, everything affects you. Everything your spouse does affects you. And so you're, you're bothered, you feel rejected, you feel like your needs aren't getting met, so on and so forth. What are you going to do? And we constantly have to ask ourselves that question in marriage because the answer is going to make all the difference in the world. Here's truth number three. All meaningful relationships cause pain, especially the closer ones. And without a redemptive spirit in the relationship, it's doomed to failure. We hurt each other. Even, even the best of us hurt each other. We don't mean to. But in a, in a close, meaningful relationship, there's just going to be some pain. Our wounds heal, uh, hurt each other. You know, hurt people hurt people. That's the old saying. Well, when Karen and I got married, we were devastated. I mean, we, we weren't hurt. We were devastated. We both came out of backgrounds where we came into marriage devastated. We were like two porcupines trying to love each other. It was a painful experience. Karen's words hurt me. My words hurt her. We, we were, you know, when you're already wounded... Just the smallest thing can hurt really deeply. And so we, and let me just give you a little advertisement here. We have a resource called uh, 21 Day Inner Healing Journey. 
And it's an app. It's online. It's 21dayjourney.com, but it's 21 days of leading people through inner healing. And this is, it, there's a workbook. I have two hours of video on there over 21 days. But if you have issues of, of, of hurt that you have brought into your marriage, it compounds the, the nature of marriage already because we're going to hurt each other. We're going to bother each other. But if we import wounds into the relationship, that's not our spouse's fault. But it's going to cause us to overreact. It's going to cause us to do things that, that continue the hurt, the, the dance that, that's created. Our immaturities hurt each other. You know, our hurts hurt each other, but just our immaturities. I had a friend, this has been years ago, and he was, uh, I think he's been through five marriages. Um, and uh, he invited me to come to his wife's birthday party one year. And so I went to his wife's birthday party, and I get to the birthday party, and uh, his group of guys were standing around, and I said, uh, hey, what would you get your wife for her birthday? He said, a fishing boat. And I said, fishing boat. And he said, got a brand new fishing boat. I said, I didn't know she fished. He said, she did. He bought, he bought his wife a $30,000 fishing boat, and she didn't fish. He bought it for himself. She divorced him. And he thought that was the funniest thing in the world. You know, that, now, the joke ended pretty quick. I mean, that was the worst birthday party I've ever been to in my life. And when he told her what he had gotten her, she just stood there and looked at him. And he said, what a, you know, just an immature guy that thinks he's funny, that thinks he's cool and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but, but our immaturities hurt each other. Our sins hurt each other. When we sin, obviously, you know, the, saying words that are hurtful or doing things that are sinful, they hurt each other. Our insensitivities and ignorance hurt each other. I had a friend, and a really good guy. He's a pastor. And, and he tells a story. And um, he and his wife were laying in bed one night. And they weren't asleep, the, but the lights were off. And so he was laying here. She's laying here. And um, he said, you know, he's got his hands behind his head. And he's just feeling great about everything. He said, you know something? I've never been happier in my whole life. I've never felt this good. I just think everything's going great. And blah, blah, blah. And so he says that, and a couple of seconds later, he feels the bed shaking. And she is sobbing on the other side of the bed. And she said, I have never been more miserable in my entire life. He said, I had no idea. He's a good man. He, he's a good man. He's a good husband. But he was insensitive. And I'm just saying, marriage is going to hurt. Even the best marriage. I'm not talking about a level 10. Sometimes it's a level 10. But on a level two or three or four, it's going to hurt. We hurt Jesus. We killed a righteous man. I killed that man. My sins killed him. That's the reality of it. I hurt that man. And his response was redemption. His response was not anger, rejection, sending me to hell, which I deserved. That was not his response. His response was redemption. And that he left me that example to follow in his footsteps. And the main area that I'm going to demonstrate that, according to 1 Peter, is in the area of marriage. In the same way, you wives, in the same way, you husbands, you're going to have to redeem each other through redemptive love. So let me talk about the five main choices that we have when our spouse hurts us. Okay? So we, there, there are five basic choices. So your spouse does something. Your spouse says something. And I know you all have good marriages. I mean, you're here at a marriage conference. You're teachable people. And so you're here to kind of tune up your marriage. But even in the best marriages, we still say things from time to time that hurt each other. We, we do things that you know, we shouldn't do. So how are you going to respond? This is the question. When your spouse does something that hurts you and, and you don't like, how are you going to respond? Let me give you the first choice. Righteously responding to our spouse in an honest, loving, and timely manner. In other words, your spouse does something that, that you don't like, and you walk up to him righteously and say, Honey, can I talk to you for just a minute? I love you. I think you're great. We're on the same team. That bothered me when you said that. Excellent. Excellent. Ephesians 4 says, Speaking the truth in love, we grow up. Um, so you go to your spouse. They do something wrong. You go to them. You tell them how you're feeling. You do it righteously. And they say, Hang it on your beak. You did the right thing, but they don't, do, they don't respond well. Okay? So you did the right thing, but now they didn't give you the response that you were looking for. But you did the right thing. Okay? There's, that's one choice. Okay? The second is receive the hurt and frustration and hide our true feelings. This is where passive-aggressive behavior comes in. In other words, you hurt me, I'm going underground. I'm going to act like everything's okay. 
but I'm going to start, you know, eating potato chips in bed. I know you don't like that. I'm going to start, you know, turning the TV up louder. I'm, a, I'm just going to do things that I know you don't want me to do, and I'm not going to do things I know you want me to do. And this is going to destroy our intimacy, destroy our passion, and now I'm being dishonest about how I feel because I'm, I'm going underground. Okay. It happens all the time where people do this. Number three, reject our spouse when they hurt or frustrate us. And this is just, again, it can be overt or covert, but listen to this. Hebrews 13.5 says this. God says this. This is covenant language. I will never leave you nor forsake you. On day one of our relationship with God, he makes us two promises. He will never physically desert us, and he will never turn his heart away from us. Leave means physical. Forsake means emotional. So day one, and, and, and we're going to do some things that Jesus doesn't like. Anybody agree with that? We do every day. And so here's what God says day one of the relationship. You know something? I'm all in. I love you. I'm all in. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And here's what it means. There'll never be a moment in eternity where God is not focused on you emotionally. Let me say that another way. All bad things happen when you turn your heart away from your spouse. They're not meeting your needs. They're hurting you. They're saying things that you don't like. They're doing things that you don't like. And in response to that, you just reject them. You know, and again, it can be overt where you call them names, you're angry, you're sarcastic. You just overtly put on your green zip-up jumpsuit and go in the garage and build something for 30 years. <laughs> My neighbor, I used to have a neighbor did that every night. Put on his green zip-up jumpsuit and he, he hated his wife. And went in the garage and built something. So, <laughs> what, what are you going to do? But understand this. All bad things in marriage happen the instant you turn your heart away. Now, you can be sitting right next to your spouse, but your heart's not there. You've turned it away. And that's, that is very common in marriage issues, especially when you're frustrated, especially you, where you get to that point of, why aren't you changing? Why aren't you doing, I'm trying here. You're not trying. And you get frustrated, and you get angry, then the rejection comes. That's another choice that a lot of people make. The next is revenge to make them pay for what they've done and fear doing it again. And this is, I'm going to get you back. I'm going to make you suffer. And, and part of this is establishing a spirit of fear and dominance, where I'm going to dominate the relationship, and you'll either do what I say or you'll pay a high price. And that happens, again, in a lot of marriages, especially as the anger increases. Okay? But here's, here's the fifth one. Okay? Now, let me say something real quick. No one su su should subject themselves to abuse. When I'm saying suffering, I'm just saying all of us suffer in marriage. But there's a difference between suffering and abuse. Suffering is discomfort. Abuse is damage. Don't ever subject yourself to another person damaging you in a marriage relationship. You can, uh, we, we counsel people to do constructive separation. If you're in an abusive marriage, don't divorce. Go to a neutral place. Have your spouse go to another place. Uh, don't live together. And don't, don't go back into the relationship until they get real help and demonstrate that they've changed and that there's accountability in the relationship. So I'm not talking about enabling abuse. I want you to be sure about that. I'm just talking about living with an imperfect person in an imperfect world with a devil who hates us. We all live in that world, and we're going to all have to deal with this. Well, here's number five, uh, choice. And that is redeem our spouse through righteous, proactive behavior. You're doing the wrong thing. I, I was doing the wrong thing. Jesus came. I was hurting Jesus. I killed him, in fact. I was hurting Jesus, and his response was to die for me and to suffer for me while I was in my sins. And because of that, I've come back. And I haven't just come back. There's no one I love like I love Jesus. Okay. So that's my fifth choice, and that's the only choice that works. It's the only thing. The word redeem means to buy back or restore something to its created purpose. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to pay a price for you that either you cannot pay or will not pay. Jesus paid a price for us that we could not pay. But I'm going, to, I'm going to pay a price for you. This is going to cost me something. It's going to cost me some pain. It's going to cost me some time. It's going to cost me something. But I'm willing to pay it to demonstrate my love for you. That's what it is. So we, we're going to become partners with God to do this. And here's the question. Am I going to be a redeemer or am I going to respond to my spouse's problems in a selfish and immature manner? This is the question. This is the question that 
that will really answer the destiny of your marriage, the destiny of your... Karen, this is just the way that it is. Our answer to that question is, is everything.